Hi, I'm Courtney Bailey, Chief Development Officer for MPTF. What you're about to hear is one of the panels that took place during our recent women's conference, Deal With It, on July 28, 2019. Madeline Hammond, who produces the conference, took great care to make sure we found the best speakers to cover the most relevant topics of today. This event is for the betterment of women in the entertainment industry, but there is such great information here that can really help everybody. So listen, enjoy, and most importantly, feel free to pass it along to someone who may benefit from this information as well. This session is called Demystifying Investing. Today you'll be listening to a discussion that was recorded live, so be kind. There may be areas where the audio drops out a bit or an audience member's question is hard to hear, but don't worry, you'll definitely get the context of what the panel is about. MPTF is providing this podcast as a public service, but it is neither a legal interpretation nor a statement of MPTF policy. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by MPTF. The views expressed by our guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Views and opinions expressed by MPTF employees are those of the employees and do not necessarily reflect the view of MPTF or any of its officials. Thank you for listening. I guess we'll get started so we can keep on on schedule. Uh, Thank you everyone for attending. Um, This panel has a very ambitious title. It's Demystifying Investing and What You Need to Know About the Tax Laws and Retirement in 50 minutes plus questions. So I think it's a a lot to uh, bite off. But fortunately, we have an all-star panel. Next to me, Liz Weston. I'm going to let them all give a little introduction. And Stacy Schreier and Jennifer Burnham Grubbs. Did you want to yeah, just briefly, introduce yourself briefly? I'm uh, Liz Weston. I'm a personal finance columnist for NerdWallet. And my Q&A money talk appears into the, in the Los Angeles Times. I've written five books about money, including a bestseller called Your Credit Score, of all sexy topics. <laughs> and uh, I live in Los Angeles with my husband and daughter and a golden retriever over in Studio City. Hi, my name is Stacy Schreier, and I've been doing CPA work and accounting and tax in Texas. Are you here? Oh, make that magic happen. Okay. (laughs) Okay. uh, My name again is Stacy Schreier, and I have been doing accounting and tax work for about. 30 years now. I've owned my own business. I've also worked for companies. Um, What else can I say? I live in the San Fernando Valley with my husband and my son, and I really love tax, and I love this world, even though everybody cringes. I find it fascinating, and I love helping people do what they need to do. Hi, everybody. My name is Jennifer Burnham Grubbs. I'm the co-founder of Quantum Insurance Services. We founded in 2012. Um, I was a Princeton graduate who never expected to be in insurance. And I entered uh, when I thought I was in between jobs considering business school, a sector that I found to be really problematic. Uh, where most of the advisors were sort of salespeople, not advisors, abusing trust, actually, in my opinion, most of the time. And then I thought, well, somebody needs to fix that. Who better than me? (laughs) So we founded our firm in 2012 um, as a commissions agnostic insurance consulting firm. And our mission is to help people understand insurance because it is useful the right way for their own pockets, not the advisor's pockets. Well, terrific. I'm Judy Catano, I'm a corporate lawyer, and I'm not an individual financing expert at all, so I'm really happy to be here for this panel. I know I'm gonna learn a lot today. So one one of the things we'd like to get the ball rolling and talk about is about fear and attitude around investing in money, and a lot of women do have a lot of fear or anxiety about that. Am I reverbing? Uh, We worry we won't get it right, we worry we won't have enough, and so I know you all have talked about this a little bit, and maybe I'll toss it to Jennifer first. I know you've look at some studies and yeah one of the things we were talking chatting just as we got to know each other before this panel and it was very timely about a month and a half ago my daughters are at a school where they were doing something about women in stem or steam which is science technology engineering arts and math and I noticed they had astronauts and engineers and I had asked if I could just do something about business as well because it was underrepresented and they said sure I said you know because business and math they go together And so I was doing some research and I started studying stats about women and money. And it was great because in researching for this, I learned that women are actually better with money than men, which is a common misconception, 
at least they maybe men would like us to think that they're better at it than we are. Um, but I think it's really empowering to know that before we even get to what are some of the things you might want to get to as you're at the seminar and planning for yourself, is to know you're capable. Know that you're beyond capable, that you're probably better at it than maybe some of your neighbors who may be male that you might just think in your mind or on this and you aren't or something. Just get that whole thing out of the way completely. The stats show women are better with money than men. The one thing women have um, it's holding them back a bit is that men are very comfortable taking on risk with money. They'll kind of do stupid stuff with money. But as long as they're taking risks, they can kind of succeed upwards often. And women can be so risk averse that they may be better at collecting, gathering, and keeping their money, saving their money, being smart with their money. But because they can be so fearful and risk averse, at the long run, they'll end up shortchanged fearful of asking for a raise, fearful of taking a small investment because I don't know what I'm doing. And then, you know, while someone else is earning 6%, you're earning zero. That's what puts women behind is fear of risk. So I think Liz and others are going to have some really empowering things to help get over that. But before we get any further, I just want you all to know you're gifted at it. So that's one of the things I want to share. Anyone have anything to add? Oh, I, yeah. I wanted to throw in that the, the risk aversion thing is a, is a big chunk of this, but there was a German, that is really annoying. Um, <laughs> there was a German group that went through and did regression analysis of all the studies that consistently show women are more risk averse and found out when, if women had the same amount of money as men, they would be just at the same level, they would be taking the same risks essentially. So the stuff that's keeping us back is the earning less, the taking, you know, the caretaking, um, the not having as much money to play with. So, but when we get in there and we do it, we do really well. Great. Well, Liz, you, you wrote a book that's, an, that's a bestseller talking about how to get someone who hasn't spent a lot of time thinking about their money or caring about their money to start getting those on-ramps to get on board. Can you share some of that with us? How many? Maybe move it down. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That's a good idea. All right. Is that better? Yeah. You guys even... I, I have some theater training, so I can belt to the, yeah. you know... <laughs> let's try that. How many of you were in the sex session? Okay. <laughs> Investing is like sex. <laughs> that should be the title. <laughs> Would have packed the room. You don't wait until you're an expert to start, right? You dive in and you figure it out as you go. That's exactly how it should be with investing. Okay? You don't wait until you know what you're doing. <laughs> You'll have some interesting adventures along the way. You'll learn. That's that's the whole thing. And with, if you're holding back or you're not sure or you're just doing the minimum, this is what at NerdWallet. This is what we tell people. You put at least, as, if you have a match, if you have a 401k at work. Oh, first of all, how many of you know if you have a retirement plan at work? Yes or no? Okay. Three out of ten workers don't even know if they have a retirement plan at work. So if you don't know, you got good company. Go ask your HR person. If you do have a retirement plan at work, chances are it's got a match. Get that full match. Do whatever you have to do to shove that money in. That is free money. And how many of us don't like free money? Right? That's where we need to go. Start there. Put it in the target date fund. Almost all 401ks, 403bs, whatever you've got at work has something called a target date retirement fund. And basically what that just does is like if you're going to be retiring in 30 years, you add it, let's say 2020 20 plus 30, that's 2050. You put your money there, let it ride. That fund is doing everything you need to do. It's making sure you're diversified, which means you've got money in different pots. It's making sure that it's getting a little bit more conservative as you get older. It's doing everything for you so you don't have to worry about it. Most of us have better things to do than become or try to become investment gurus and to do this 24-7. Fortunately, we've got all the technology in the world right now to take this burden off of us. And if you don't have that at work, if you don't have that through a workplace plan or you're maxing out your 401k, good on you, there are robo-advisors that do the same thing. Betterment, Wealthfront, Personal Capital. They're all doing the same thing. Or uh, Schwab has one, Fidelity has one, Vanguard has a great one. They're all doing it through computerized investing. And computers are better than human beings because they're doing this 24-7. They're not emotional. They're not trying to make extra commissions off you. They're just taking care of it. So it's not that this is the only way to invest, but if you're not sure about investing, if you're just getting started, Check those things out. Check those resources out, because that's the best way to get going. 
I'd like to add to what? Oh, sorry. Can you repeat those for? Oh. Oh, betterment and wealth fund. Oh, yeah. The 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 um, they're called robo advisors. So, betterment and wealth front and personal capital were three of the startups that started this whole movement going. And now Vanguard has one called Vanguard Personal Services. They actually will assign you a certified financial planner, which I'm also a CFP, but I don't do planning for a living. But it's really good to have one on board. Uh, Schwab has two types. One is purely robo, and all, then another version has you can talk to a human being. And Fidelity has one now. I think on those are the high, uh, most companies now have some version, or try, most big companies are trying to get a robo on board because they've realized this does something better than the human being. The human beings are still there for the touch points, which most of us need. What might that be called if you go on the website and you're looking for a robo-advisor? I would just do, you know, if you're already at like at um, Schwab, you just do Schwab plus robo-advisor. That should bring it up. Uh, we have articles on NerdWallet about selecting a, a robo-advisor that I think are really good. So you do NerdWallet plus robo-advisor, and we'll just kind of lay out, this is good for you. If you're in this situation, this is good if that's just that situation. And I was going to say, to kind of piggyback onto what Liz said, is that the biggest determining factor is time, is how much time is on that money. And time is so crucial. The sooner you get that dollar into that fund, the more time there is for the power of compound interest to work for you. It is almost an automatic thing. Honestly, there's a little mystification that goes into, oh, well, like we, we picture there's some genius somewhere that's getting us that extra 2% because of their talent. But really, time trumps talent. If, if you're 20, and you have a 401k, and you're not investing in your 401k, sh honestly, shame on you. Like, that's just the stupidest thing you can do, I'll be honest. Like, it, you know, if you're 40 or you're 50, and you learn today that you haven't figured out if you have a 401k, make this your Monday action point. It's that important. Time is absolutely critical in terms of putting yourself further ahead faster. And I'd also like to add that as well, that most companies, if you do work for a big company, they do have people on site that can help you with your 401k plan. Um, and, the, and I think companies are really trying to get that more organized and get people out there to help you do what you need to do because there's all different kinds of 401k plans. There's a Roth 401k plan, there's regular 401k, and the target is, is the best for somebody who doesn't want to sit there and look at it. We're not experts at that. Somebody else is, so let them do their job and do the target date. It's a great way to get started and really build your money with time as well. I should have asked, are, are, who's in the motion picture 401k? Okay. Uh, that's another good one, by the way. What about for some women who may be middle-aged and above that, who maybe haven't put away as much money as they would have liked? What might be the first steps? We're talking about paying yourself, but we're also talking about maybe managing debt, and how maybe we can help people think about how to think about those trade-offs. Well, one, one thing is our arbitrage, right, which sounds like a fancy word, but again, going back to my concept of risk, right, women are great at putting themselves last. And I don't mean to speak in generalizations. There are wonderful men, and there are crappy women. And it's like, <laughs> but I'm just talking wide, bigoted swaths for a moment. Um, you know, what I, I noticed, for example, my husband, we both have children. We're co-parents. He's a wonderful mate. He's great at making sure he gets his needs first met. And I'm not as good at it. I learn from him. So we can take a page out of that book. And in terms of debt, there's this good girl in us, I think, that wants to like get out of trouble, pay the debt. But take a moment and look. What's the interest rate on that debt? What is what you could gain in your 401k? Arguably, at least a 4%. So if you're going to be worrying about paying off debt and using all your cash flow towards that when it's like a 3% interest rate, instead of participating in your 401k where you get 4%, maybe 6%, maybe 12% if you're young and you have lots of years, then think. Think about it. Are you just trying to be a good girl or are you looking out for you? Right? Like Try to think like that. Yeah, and many women do not put retirement plans first. Women just don't tend to do that. I don't know why. I don't know if we weren't brought up that way. Retirement is really important. All the other things are important. Paying off your house, paying for college, your health care. All of these things are important. But retirement is also important. And, and the beauty is, as, as Jennifer said, is you have time. A lot of people have time. And even if, you, even if you're 50, you still may be working 20 years. You still have time on your hand. Get 
involved in your retirement planning. Do something. It is extremely important because women outlive men. What if your husband's doing it all and he's not necessarily thinking about how he, what happens when he's gone? You need to protect yourselves and, and take care of that all the way around for everything. And it does take, you have to look at everything, your debt versus your retirement versus kids' college versus this versus that. I mean, men tend to be more single driven. Women are looking like, oh, I have all these things. But you need to put retirement in your mix and most people don't. They're just looking at all these things in front of them, but retirement needs to be one of the one of the things. We generally tell people if you have mortgage debt, student loan debt, that is not debt you should be rushing to pay off. And if you know any young women, or, or even you know, middle-aged or older women, who have student loan debt, they, they a lot of times they're obsessed with it and getting mm -hmm. it paid off as quickly as possible. That could be the worst thing you could do, especially if you're not contributing to retirement. And again, it's the good girl thing. I think I'm, you know, I'm going to take care of this, and then I'll get to retirement. But as Jennifer said, you are wasting your most precious resource, which is time. There is nothing like that early start. And mm -hmm. we've got all kinds of charts on NerdWallet to show you that the difference between st starting retirement at 25 versus starting at 35 is enormous. Millions of dollars. Yeah. yeah. Basically, what, what you could get essentially doubles in that 10 years. And if you wait till 45, you know, it's, it's even worse, sorry, but that's the way the math works out. So get those women started on saving for retirement slow the roll on paying off yeah. all that low rate debt. It's not the worst thing in the world to have. So if that's and the one message you get out of And teach your children too. Teach your children. If you, like I have a 16 year old who's now a camp counselor, he got his first paycheck. And he's like, what is all this? You know, and we went, I'm like, don't you know what I do for a living? <laughs> Give me your check. <laughs> you know, like, let's see, oh, this tax is for this and this is for this. And I was thinking like, maybe, yes, he, he wants to save, he wants to spend, he wants to but maybe I should put a percentage in an IRA. Wow, like that's kind of weird at 16. But imagine, even if I put 50 bucks of his paycheck, what is that gonna be when he's 60 or 70? I mean, he's got his whole life to let this grow and not and not touch. Um, so it's one of the things to think about when you're talking to kids or grandkids. Hey, maybe we should put $10, you know, of that check in either savings or IRA. Even an IRA is great. and. And there's a lot, of, and we'll get into this, but there's a lot of tax planning you can do. That IRA, you know, he's probably not gonna pay any taxes, he'll get that money back. But let's say he's making a little bit more. Well, you know, if he puts it in an IRA, he could take a deduction for it and get all his money back. You know, so the government is trying to help people with this. And if you're younger, it's really an opportunity to take advantage of that for sure. I will say though, Judith, circling back to your question, is let's say, you know, let's say somebody's 50 or thereabouts, approaching 50, five years before, five years after. It's also a really critical time to be zeroing in very carefully because you do have this runway of roughly 25 years, maybe 30, before you're likely to need, for example, long term care. The average age now is actually like 83, statistically 82. So you still have a lot of time, even though we're talking so much about the advantages of early planning when you're in your 20s. 50 and thereabouts is also another really critical moment for getting awake, getting clued in on all of this and making your moves because you know, we handle insurance products and there are certain products now where if you're getting a good, well-designed product, you can be adding your long-term care and getting that set up while the costs for insurance are still relatively reasonable and you have 20, 30 years for it to be working on your behalf. So you just don't want to kind of wait I mean, I, I hate to tell this anecdote, but I had a person whose husband was just passing away. He's in hospice. And they called a friend of a friend of a friend, and they know that I'm an insurance expert. And they called and they said, she's asking about final expense. He's going to die in two days. And I was like, no, you can't, you can't buy final expense two days before you're dying. Like, yeah. the bare minimum <laughs> is two years. Like, you can't wait until the very end and then hope there's a way of torquing some solution out of nothing. Like, you really do need to be thinking ahead. But the encouraging part is if you do that, there are so many ways you can find a way to bring it together. And we can talk more about that. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about resources and advisors. There's different kinds. Who do we need on our team? What's core? How do they get paid? What does that cost? Does one of you want to take the lead on that one? Well, I will, because this is my hobby horse. <laughs> so important. I even have a t-shirt that says that I love the F word, and it says fiduciary. And that's 
$20 word basically means is the person that you're hiring has to put your interests first. And I was talking about a friend of mine who's an inheritor, and she just inherited her, husband, her father's broker. And I kept saying to her, honey, you need a second opinion. You need somebody else to take a look at this, make sure that you're on track. We talked for 20 minutes, and finally she stopped and said, wait a minute. He's not required to put my interests ahead of his own? It's like, no, he can put you in crap. As long as he can make an argument that it's suitable somehow, he doesn't have to put your interests first. So that's what you want in your primary financial advisor is someone who is a fiduciary and willing to put that in writing. And that's where the conversation will end with most advisors. They are not fiduciaries. So I really, because I'm a CFP, I went through the training. I realized how much I didn't know by the end of it. I'm a really strong believer in getting some kind of CFP on your team, because they are fiduciaries, getting it in writing that they're going to put your interests first. So that's your, to me, is the core part of your team. As you start accumulating more money, you're going to need more people on that team. The good news, and I'll let the, the other women take over, but the good news is there's a lot of ways to get financial planning advice now that is affordable. Um, the, the robo advisors I was talking about, many of them have a CFP alternative or, or part of the package where you can talk to somebody. And getting a full-blown financial plan might not be something you need in your 20s, but I would say that as you're you know, entering midlife, it's a really good idea to have that. They're, they're not necessarily cheap. If you're paying just cash for it, it can cost $2,500. But now there's more financial planners that are doing monthly retainers, $100 or $200 a month that you pay. So you can spread that cost out over time. There's a group called the XY Planning Network. And this, they started out just focusing on XY generation, but they have a great model that applies to everyone who wants them, which is that you can do it with a monthly retainer. And I think that's a wonderful way to get started with financial planning. So uh, other than seeing that they're a CFP, are there other ways to, to find out if someone is a fiduciary or not, other than saying, you know, I want it in writing today. <laughs> give, to me, give it to me before I talk to you. Are there ways to suss that out? Well, you can go look at their form ADV. Um, which is something they have to file with the SEC. They might, there's usually a state equivalent mm -hmm. as well. The, but my, to me, the best way to ask is just ask directly. Because if they are not, they won't be able to sign that. It's called a fiduciary oath, and you can look online to get a copy of it. Bring that with you to your first meeting. Can and, you sign this? And I believe they had to pass a law, right? Didn't they pass a law to be a fiduciary or something? Like they had to oh, force people to be fiduciaries That's for a something. Long... They were trying yeah. to do that, and then the, the election happened, and that went by One, the wayside. Yeah. So we were, <laughs> we were on track to having everybody dealing with, finan with retirement advice being fin fiduciaries, and that's no longer the case. So total buyer beware. Yeah. You've got to be really careful when you're out. And I think most CPAs are um, fiduciaries. And attorneys. Yes. Attorneys are also and attorneys. fiduciaries. And um, attorneys. Yeah, I think that's true. You really want somebody working in your best interest. And we had talked about this, that nowadays it seems like you go to a Merrill Lynch and suddenly they're going to provide all of your services under one umbrella. And, oh, that sounds great and everything. But everybody's getting paid for that. You know, this investment advisor, she refers you to the loan people to refinance your loan. She's going to get a kickback or credits or a raise or something that's going to make her look better because of it. She's going to go over here and get your investment stuff. She's going to get your retirement set up. That one umbrella sounds really great. I only have to make an appointment and go once a year, but that may not be in the best interest of you. How many people are market, you know, when you go and get a home loan, there's a lot of options out there today. Don't you want a lot of variety to choose from? Not everybody does, and that takes work, but you should always have somebody who's looking out just for you and your best interest and knows your whole picture and knows your whole financial situation. Because what loan works for her or what retirement plan works for her is not necessarily what works for me. So you should be really cautious of that, of the one-size-fits-all type the other, environment. The other F word that's really important to know is fee only. Yeah. And you will see people advertise themselves as fee-based. That's not the same thing. That was the big wirehouse who was trying to get on this trend of fee only. What fee only means is they're compensated only by money that you pay them, mm -hmm. by the fee that you pay them. And that cuts out all those kickbacks so. and commissions and trips to Aruba, oh my yeah. God. Um, so it's all about, you know, you have this straight, clean relationship. That's why it costs money. Right, <laughs> I mean, like, it, it does cost you. money. 
the environment, I think it's they're not it. good. I mean, one of the things I was going to say is second opinions are great. So, for example, if you have a um, if you have someone that's in your family that you've inherited and they, they've been doing this for a long time and no one's ever looked under the hood, it doesn't hurt. If you go through your network and find some other names to have a second opinion, just take an outside look. Because a lot of times, if you're working in a vacuum, it's very easy. You know, the panelist was talking about what happened in the in the gold medalist sector where there were very few people and it's got stagnant air and all things are going wrong. I mean, second opinions are really helpful because the work of a good advisor will stand on its own. It'll stand to the test of broad daylight. If you know someone's providing insurance recommendations, or for example, they shouldn't be afraid to have whoever else is on your team take a look at it. It should stand the test of another person taking a look. We love when we have surgical specialists who work across silos, right? Like we might be experts in this sector, but we're really not we're not going to replace a tax expert. We're not going to even re replace a CFP. So when you can have a team where you say, hey, we're doing this. What do you think about it? And then you get multiple viewpoints. There should be consensus, roughly, when you're getting good advice that this is the right thing for you. And another thing is, if you do have someone that you kind of start to sense, whether it's your accountant or whoever, or you really don't feel like they're maybe giving you the most current advice or the best advice or they're phoning it in, don't be afraid to break up with them. Yeah. It's OK. You don't owe them. They need to be working for you and earning your trust and your money. So it, it's a good idea. And it. It really is. If you're not comfortable with the people giving you advice, then find somebody else. I mean, because even as a, and I'll make a definition or a differentiation between like a tax preparer versus a tax advisor. If somebody isn't comfortable with me, they're not going to be, they're not going to be giving me the information that I need to be more helpful to them. So let's go somewhere else. Let's break up. You know, I think that you can break up with the family accountant who's been doing everybody's tax returns for 100 years. You, you can go and shop it. And there's a lot of people out there. And just to differentiate a little between advisors, a tax preparer is somebody you go to once a year. You bring them your shoebox or your stuff and all your receipts and all your things that you hated putting together in the first place, and you're pissed and it's the last, you know, you're in, in April already and they've been calling you since February. <laughs> you drop it down, you leave, you come back or they mail it to you, you pay a fee and you're done. They didn't ask you any questions. They didn't necessarily, or they may have asked you one question. A tax advisor, is, is somebody who's going to say, who's available to you all year. So I have clients who email me, hey, I just had this happen. Should I be doing this or this? Or I just got some stock options. Should I um, sell some stock to pay the taxes? Do I need to do estimates? Do I need to do this? Um, I just had a baby. Should I set up my 529 or should I wait? Should I, you know, that's what tax advising can help you with help you with those decisions. Oh, I just added something in my house, or we're going to do a remodel. Do I want to take that out? Or do I want to take a loan from my 401k? Do I want to take a loan? Do I want to take a credit line? You need somebody who can see the whole picture from a tax, from an insurance, from a finance. Just sees the whole picture for what it is, not just, you know, here's my tax return. You know, oh, good, I only paid $300. My friend, my friend did it, and it's great. You know, how do you know it's great? How do you know? How do you know you forgot to tell them something? The of having a core team. Yeah, who would be that? I'd say, uh, first of all, I'd say a really good accountant, someone who is not a tax preparer, someone who's really, it kind of, I'm thinking, it goes back to what you said about it being like the sex thing where you want to be confident, empowered, and it can have dialogue, right? Like, it should be like that with your relationships with your advisors as yeah. well. There are no stupid questions. Nope. The only dumb thing is to be too quiet and not ask, right? Um, so a good accountant, I think, will have, um, first of all, recommendations probably as to other really talented people for certain needs. Sometimes they'll be able to identify, like for example, we have a lot of accountants who will identify that their client really doesn't have long-term care and should have some, and then they'll say, you know, you ought to go get some. And then maybe they'll refer to two people, will be one of them, and then whoever's work stands. But it's not like a referral giving back and forth thing. Um, but a really plugged-in accountant who's really savvy is a great component um, I also think that you do want to have an investment advisor or a, I mean, look, I'm a big fan of Vanguard because their fees are low. I'm really cheap about fees. But, you know, like anywhere where, um, and the robo advisor thing sounds great. Like, a, you know, where your money's sitting while it's working for you, you should be pulling value out of that. They're lucky to have your money. Your money's earning them money. So, you know, get empowered with that. Look a little bit at 
how good are they at what they're doing? If it's anonymous and you feel like you can't, and you get, can't get any care, there are hundreds of thousands of hardworking people out there who would love to be your advisor instead. I mean, I know so many different people who actually really work hard for the right to have your money and be working for it. So I guess that, you know, an investment advisor, and then I think an insurance, you know, Insurance is a big piece of the puzzle, but it has to be designed correctly. It has to be really lean and efficient. And hopefully you're triangulating between at least those three components and you ought to be in pretty good shape. I was, uh, when I started the Certified Financial Planner Training Program, I thought a reasonably intelligent woman could handle her own personal finances. And by the time I got done, I had uh, an investment manager, I had an insurance person, I had an estate planner, and I realized, you know, eventually we were going to need a, and a financial planner of our own. And it's like therapists needing therapists, mm -hmm. financial planners need financial planners. It's just too complicated to do this all on our own. When you're starting out, you don't have a lot of money. I think the robo-advice is great, especially if there's a CFP component to it. I think as you accumulate more money, you need to have a full-on, you know, dedicated financial advisor, and I would say a CFP. And that, to me, would be the core. I've been through a few accountants, and you know, I'd say, I think I finally found one that we're happy with. So to me, it's easier to find that financial advisor piece. But wherever you start, I think the people do need a team, and they need more than one person. And software is great when you have no money. But I just did a story about a guy that did uh, Quicken Wills Will make her software, and he had a $10 million estate, and he screwed up. Yeah, of course. Big time. Yeah. So we all need to have expert help get us through this process. And I, to me, it, the financial planner is sort of the first person and branch out from there. And the good thing of having a team, as opposed to just that one person, again, is there's checks and balances a little. Because, mm -hmm. right, you can always be running it past someone and just saying, hey, I'm getting this, what do you think? And then again, when there's kind of resonating advice and synergy between what the things you're hearing from all your different touch points, then you, you're, you have your confidence, too, that you're starting to get on the right track of everything. Yeah. Let's turn a little bit to the tax laws, because I know that was in the headline. Uh, it's a big topic for a short amount of time. But Stacey, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the headline yeah, changes in the recent um, year? So it was a big overhaul. Probably haven't seen something like this in this tax world since about 1986. It was, um, it was big. Everything changed, including the forms. I don't know if you noticed your form change. So it was a very exciting time for us tax, uh, tax advisors, especially, um, you know, there's a lot of questions and a lot of changes. So some of the big ones that you probably have heard about is like the standard deduction change. So it used to be standard deduction personal exemption, you know, for a single person that gave you about 10 or 11,000. This is if you don't itemize, you don't have a house, you don't do taxes, that kind of thing. You got the general standard deduction. They raised that a little bit. So before it was maybe 10 or 11,000, it's now 12,000 for single. It was about 21, you know, 20,000. For married filing joint, it's now twenty-four thousand. So that's that was great for people who never itemized. They got a, a little increase. In addition, the rates went down a little. It's sort of just the rates went down a little, and they increased the size. So you might have paid one or two percent less overall on your taxes. It may have not have felt that way, <laughs> but there was a little bit of that mixed in. Child care credit. I thought this was kind of interesting. Clients who had never gotten the child care credit are getting it now because the limits, your AGI limits were much higher. So people making a little bit more, you know, here in Southern California, you know, 100,000 is a lot of money, but it's not significant. But you weren't getting any credit for your children because you, you didn't meet the AGI limits and you made too much for that. So now those have really increased, which I, I found a lot of people really got to take advantage of it. Um, that they hadn't before. I think that was great. Um, some of the less great things that have been in the uh, in, in the news a lot of um, on the itemized deduction side, miscellaneous expense deductions. I don't know if that affects a lot of you, but you have W-2s. Um, people who get W-2s don't have a deduction for their business expenses. All they got was this miscellaneous, which was limited already, but at least some people got some benefit for it. And what that means is if you are a W-2 employee, but your employer doesn't reimburse you for everything, and in order for you to get clients, in order for you to go out, you're paying, you know, you're taking them out to eat, you're buying gifts, you have to subscribe to magazines, you have dues, you have these things that your employer just won't reimburse. A lot of 
employers are not doing that anymore. Well, you lose that deduction now. And I'll tell you ways that we can change that, but that was huge for a lot of people. Home office, your auto, all of that is gone. Um, the other big, big one is state tax deductions. I'm sure you all heard about this. You know, if you owned a home and you paid state taxes, all of that was deductible on your federal tax return, no more. They limited it to 10,000. Well, if you own a home and you bought your home, you know, five or eight years ago, your property taxes are probably at least eight or $9,000. You add on your state taxes, forget it. You're getting no benefit. People were hit really hard. And some of these other things, the standard, you know, some people were supposed to fall into the standard deduction and the, the lower interest rate was supposed to offset this. But we know that that didn't happen at all. Um, so that was kind of the bad news <laughs> of it. But one good news, if you were a business owner, you had flow, what they call flow through income, income that came from other places that flowed through into your personal tax return. You have what's called a qualified business income deduction. And this was really big and new um, to our world. And what it did is it basically said that if you have flow through income from business, from rental properties, from partnerships and things that generate income for you, you can take a 20% deduction from that right off the top, right against all your taxes. So it really made, I mean, some of the people I saw made huge differences on their tax returns. So if you file a Schedule C, for instance, brought in 100,000, you had 20,000 in deductions, you have 80,000. In the old law, you'd pay tax on 80,000 besides self-employment and all of that. But that 80,000, now you take 20% off, now you suddenly get 16,000 and you're only paying tax on 64. So for those people, we saw a huge change and we had kind of fun in our tax world of doing people's tax return on the old law and doing tax return on the new law to see what the differences were. For some people it was great, for others not so great. I think overall if you're an employee, not so great. If you had your own business or flow through or rental property or things like that, much better for you. But everybody's, what, what really was identifiable was that everybody's tax return looked different. So when you called your accountant and said, how are these tax laws gonna change? I, I, gotta, look, I gotta pull out your tax return and really look at all the details because there were so many detail changes. Um, I think overall, most people were probably in the middle. Some people did a little better, some people did a little worse. What I think most people found is that when the government changed their, changed, put in the new tax laws, they reduced the tax withholding on a lot of employees. So when they went to file their tax return, they owed a lot of money. It wasn't necessarily because of the tax laws. It was because when you're an employee and you fill out that W-4 and you put down your withholding, that's just a general federal table. So they just withhold based on what you put on that form. That form becomes important. Um, and so what we found is a lot of people, the federal government changed their withholding and a lot of people owed. Again, it wasn't necessarily because of the tax law, it was because the withholding was wrong. And that's when I say tax preparer versus tax advisor. We talked to a lot of our clients in November and December when they got new jobs. Let me see your W4, excuse me, let me see your W4, or let me do a tax protection really quickly while we're still in 2018. So if there's something more we can do for you, we can help you. Because come 2019, if you go there with your plop in March or April, we're done. This is all we can do for 2019. And I'm doing a lot more projections in 2019 because I don't think they change those tables. <laughs> so <laughs> just, just make sure you look for that because I think you're not withholding enough. Just general observation. Let's talk a little bit about retirement planning. We've talked about that uh, a little before. I know you've got some thoughts on Social Security and the importance of elections and long-term care insurance. Do you want to start and then Jennifer? Liz, okay. maybe you can, yeah. Yeah, I, starting I, this, with Social is, this is another of my hobby horses. <laughs> and I wrote a column and the original title was, don't let your husband screw up your retirement. <laughs> and I had to change husband to spouse and I couldn't use screw up, but <laughs> here's what it comes down to. All of us who write about Social Security get these emails from these guys and they're always men and they always have spreadsheets and they are always arguing that it's better for them to start their Social Security at 62 and this is they've got it wrong on every possible level they've done the math wrong they don't understand how the taxes work and they aren't thinking about their wives at all 
all. Mm -hmm. Now, the important thing about Social Security is when one of you dies, the other one, that one of the checks goes away. So you might be receiving two checks. Somebody dies, you're down to one check. It's the larger of the two checks. So when these guys retire at 62 and grab Social Security as quickly as possible, they're not only locking in a reduced check for the rest of their lives, they're also locking in a reduced survivor's check because typically they're the higher earner. And sometimes these guys have stay-at-home wives who don't have any of their own enough Social Security taxes paid in or their benefit isn't big enough to qualify on their own. So they get what's called a spousal benefit. So these guys starting early not only lock in a smaller benefit for themselves, they lock it in for their wives. And then they die and she's completely screwed. And I had one advisor tell me about a guy who not only did that or was going to do that, he was also going to take his pension. He's one of the few people that still had a pension and take the single life, which means it ended with him. So their income would have gone from 72,000 when he died to 24, just like that. And none of these guys think about their wives. And I've talked to other, you know, I'm, and I know you guys have been in the same place. It's like, hello. So don't let your husband or your spouse, whoever it is, make this decision for you. Make sure that when it's, you know, you're getting time to where this is going to be a decision, that you talk to a financial advisor, that you look at the information on your own. There's lots of great resources out there. There's something called Social Security Solutions and maximize my social security that will do the math properly. You know, a spreadsheet doesn't do it. It's way the hell too complicated. So this is a, a I've actually got a whole presentation about not letting your spouse screw up your retirement. It's really important to take the reins, even if you let them do everything else to this point. My husband lets me do everything. I'm the CFO of the house. But you know, at this point, we are sitting down and talking about all these things because they're super, super important. And for so many women, that's why so many women are, are impoverished in later mm -hmm. life is because of dumb decisions that were, sorry. Uh, <laughs> not optimal. Not optimal <laughs> solutions <laughs> that were made previously. This is going to be a podcast, right? <laughs> Men are awesome. We you see their traits. No, we do, and they are great, but it's like that. Don't let them be in a vacuum either, you know? Right. Another sounding board and maybe one way of coaching that or broaching that conversation is saying, honey, you've done so much for us and, you know, but so much is on your shoulders. Maybe, you know, maybe we should both get in on this and get together and I can learn I mean, who knows what. But I, thanks for bringing that up. It's super important. Another big concern I have is long term care for women, especially, but all people really. Long term care is really expensive. Uh, you know, even now it's like five to ten thousand dollars a month for Decent, decent to great facilities. And studies show that in, one, in 30 years, the average long-term care claim will cost $1.3 million. So it's kind of insane that you have so much pressure to have so much retirement left over after raising families and send, you know, sending kids to college and everything. You're supposed to also have you know, millions of dollars for not only just fun, but also the God forbid scenario of declining in older age and needing you know, care either around the clock or part-time or whatever. So it's one of those things people like to think about even less and they like to think about dying. It really is, it's like more unpleasant. But I really encourage people to take a look and look at it. Women are more likely than men to need long-term care. They're likely to live longer on long-term care claim than men as well, so it's really, really, really important. I noticed in this um, handout that Madeline had sent, it was something, and a few other things about all these new trends and how to kind of prepare for that phase of one's life, but advanced planning and like really starting by the time you're in your 50s is really important to try to make sure you have a provision for long-term care needs down the road. I can't emphasize it enough. And another thing I want to talk about is cash flow as we talk about that. There's really never, never ever enough money for everything. There really is not. But Rome wasn't built in the day, and there are certain things you have to just start, and then it'll get better. But you do have to force yourself. One of the things I think I'm so lucky is my first job ever out of college, the HR lady came and, and said, I don't care if you starve, you put the max you can into your 401k. <laughs> and I was like, okay, she's retiring at 65 to go win a bay going with her husband. I'm going to believe what she says, and I'm going to listen, and I'm going to do it. But there is like something about discipline. Being a woman is very expensive. We have to pay for hair. Maybe later we have to pay for Botox. We have to pay for kids, clothes, you know, to look good. But... I think financial confidence and well-being can cover a host of ills in terms of maybe not having the most polished dress or whatever when you're projecting health overall. So 
think twice about whether you really need to spend on that $1,500 bag because somehow that's going to give you the edge in your meeting or do you really have to go get manicures? Can you do your own? Like where can you save that serves you first rather than thinking Starbucks. outside? How many people go every day to Starbucks? What can I do? There are <laughs> you know? lots of places you can There's find money. There's lots of places you can find money. You know, Instead of going every day to Starbucks, go once. Yeah. My office, and we do financial stuff. Every day they're going out to Starbucks and I'm like, no, 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 there's coffee in the, they have a crew egg, you know, they've got it, they'll order any kind of coffee I want. I never get Starbucks, but I'm in this world. <laughs> you know, part of it's social, part of it's, you know, enjoying something. Do it once a week, don't do it every day. Um, everything, like it, I read something like, instead of going out to dinner, you know, seven days a week, go out to dinner twice, go out to dessert if you wanna do that, if you, or take a walk, do something else instead of going out to dinner. I mean, just little things, you will find yourself saving 10, $20 a week or more, they should be going to retirement or to insurance or to something else that can be really helpful for you. Think about, just be cognizant of where your money, how many people go out to lunch every day? I, Again, I brown bag it. People ask me, oh, you want to go lunch without lunch? I'm like, mm, I brought my lunch, but I'll take a walk with you if you want after we eat. That way you still get the social interaction. You don't have to do that every day. Or coffee meetings. And so I knew a guy, yes, one of my old bosses too. actually, when he was back on the dating <laughs> yes. scene, he started only doing coffee meetings instead of dinners because he yeah. realized like if it was a dud, he didn't want to blow the money on the dinner. <laughs> He's thinking <laughs> that way. You think yeah, that way why too. Why are we thinking that way? Yeah, why you know? do we think? Yeah. Why can't we bring our lunch to, to work? And you know, there, there's a lot of ways where you can save a dollar here, a dollar here, $10 here. You would be surprised if you're cognizant. I mean, part of money and budgeting and overall is be cognitant. Cognizant. 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 Know how to pronounce it. Um, of what you're spending and what you're doing because the truth is money, especially cash, just seems to fly out of our wallets and suddenly we're at the ATM. Be cognizant of what you're spending. Ask yourself the question, do I really need these shoes or can I buy these shoes? Can I, do I need that coffee, do I not? Just little things. I, 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 I want to just throw this in because I'm, I'm pretty frugal. My husband always talks about that, but really where the, the rubber meets the road, make more money. Yes. That's so that is so yes. Yes. That, that is the other part of this. Is definitely make sure, and there's probably a seminar on this, make sure you're for what you deserve. Make sure we all deserve to make what we are worth. And we're all worth something as women and we can always provide something at the table. Make sure, and if your current employer is not doing it, go find another job where they will appreciate what you have to offer and make sure you're getting paid for what you do. Before we turn to Q&A, does anyone have any wrap up thoughts that they'd like to offer the audience? I think I just did. Yeah. <laughs> And we had been talking about the, you know, the tax laws changing. Two things that are really important to, to take away from that. Your 401k just got more valuable yeah. because now there are fewer ways to reduce your taxes. And having that side hustle, some kind of side hustle, having multiple streams of income so that you're not just tied to one job or even one career. And those side hustles have a lot of opportunities for saving taxes as well. Yeah, that actually is a good point. You know, when they say make money, if you can't do it in your current position, then have a side job, sell makeup, sell this. Sell th you know, there's so many opportunities out there and you can search for anything on the web. I need to make a little extra income, how can I do it? I, you know, there's times, and there are jobs out there, there are other jobs out there and no matter what you think, the economy is doing better, supposedly, so if, if you can get a second job, go for it if you have the time, energy, and the wherewithal. Make sure you do that. <laughs> And I'd say just make sure you get on this. Like, do it on yeah. Monday. Think cognizantly yeah. about what's possible. And sometimes force yourself to do it even before you're 100% sure you're ready. You, you know, like, my long-term care, I forced myself to do it before I knew I really had the cash flow because I knew I could hustle and create it in time because I knew I had to do it for my tempo. And then you grow to fill the void you've created of what you've got to create. Women are so amazing and <laughs> re being resourceful and, and, and bringing it through. So it's a great motivator. Great. Any any questions? Lots of questions. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you so much. It's great. But uh, one of the things is, you know, I started later for whatever my career was, let's say. You know, and I also, you know, so I've got the vanguard of the, uh, the target date and all that. One of the things is I worked in two different places. And one of them is 
Um, because there's been such volatility and I started later, one of the things I thought about doing is doing an extended a day later than what I think my average retirement mm -hmm. might be because it'd be a slightly more aggressive thing. So one, I wonder about that. And then two, my partner, because he's older than I am and we're talking in the 70s, you know, his thing is uh, the volatility of the market now, even though we're much more, you know, bonds than stocks. Uh, is to take any kind of dividends and put that into a flat rate place for now because of what's happened over the last year and what we think will be happening in the Trump at all. So I wonder what you think about that approach um, about following that and yeah. uh, socking stuff away, which goes against everything I would think to do. What, what's, the, what's the age difference between you and your husband? Uh, seven. Seven years. Okay. Um, just to for the podcast, I'm going to repeat. There's there's issues about retirement and how to deploy the money, especially if you're getting a late start. Um, and this would be a classic case to get a financial advisor. And it's way complicated trying to do this. My husband's ten years older than I am, and there are a lot of moving parts to that. I will say, put off Social Security as long as you possibly can. Excellent, and that will be like your bond. That is guaranteed income you cannot outlive. By the way, if you are under 50, yes, Social Security will be there for you, unless they manage to brainwash you into thinking it won't and you let it go away. This is a huge deal. It's a huge source of, of guaranteed, cannot outlive, doesn't matter what the markets do. It's incredibly important. And yes, it will be there in some form for you. So we know since we're older that it is going to be there for us. So that's going to be the core of it. And then go talk to a financial planner about how to deploy this, because you've got required minimum distributions. You've got a lot of moving parts to that. So. And time horizons. Um, my question is, how do you fire your person? Do you, do you, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is my sister. But. <laughs> Yeah. that has, you know, did your long-term care, does your financial investments, um, it's not the accounting person. Yeah, there's a lot of social costs in, in yeah. breaking up I with mean, yeah. people. I mean, you go to a new person and then have them fire your person? <laughs> <laughs> That's your side hustle. <laughs> well, yeah, I think you have to be honest. Go ahead, Jennifer. I had to fire an accountant who was great, except for I just knew she wasn't the right thing for my needs after the time, you know, had had filled itself out. And it was hard, but um, I ended up, you know, just being honest. I mean, I think the, the thing you do is do it with dignity, treat the person with dignity, and just say, hey, listen, for, and you can make up little things, like, oh, for whatever, you know, but you've been wonderful, I'm really sorry we have to go, but, you know, you can do that, you know, um, but just be honest, give them the dignity of doing it, I know it's awkward, but there was a study, I was reading Psychology Today on a flight back from the, uh, New York seeing clients, and it said that a lot of times we fear uncomfortable conversations, but studies show that after you face an uncomfortable conversation, you typically feel a lot better than you expected you would after it, and, or, the uncomfortable comfortable feeling that you feared lasts a lot like shorter period of time than you had anticipated. Yeah. So I would just say like don't turn it into something you thing. can't do. Right. Turn it into something you will do like and do it with dignity. Don't you have to have a place for your money to go? You can't yes. inspire your Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Have your yeah, next. They will help you with that. Yeah, right. have your where you're going before you drop you. what you have for sure. And it also is, I'm sorry, but if you tell the person, I mean, I have been fine. <laughs> people have gone from me to other people and I find it extremely helpful to know why did, what am I not doing? that can be helpful. So I go, so I know that, oh, you know, I should be doing more of this or more of that. It's helpful, and you know. Yeah, a good happens. advisor will ask, and then you can tell them honestly, if they're, right. if they're strong enough to ask and give them the right answer. I'm an advocate for, you know, honesty or dignity and giving the opportunity to ask, but you can fudge a little reason if you have to, if it gets you, makes it easier for you to do the call. But just doing it in person, I think, is, more respectful. I was consulting with a bank just really quickly. I was consulting with a bank, and they were uh, they realized that they were losing ninety percent of their widows. They were just um, quit. So it's obviously it's happening a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you want to have a good fit, whatever it takes. Good right. fit. One more question, I think. 
Uh, hi, I'm, I'm a family law attorney, and I'm just going to follow on something Liz was saying about how to prevent your spouse from screwing you over. I mean, spouses, <laughs> under the law, they, have, they are fiduciaries to each other. They're required to treat each other like partners in a business. So, and I, you know, when I see people at the, after they've separated, it's very surprising to see how one spouse, it's usually the, the wife, doesn't know about what's going on financially. And, and that, that person usually has the less earning capacity. So it's very important to be involved and to know, I think, you know, the finances throughout the marriage and to have those conversations with your spouse and to you know, make sure that you're on top of what's going on. And then also with the tax laws, one of the changes has been also that the spousal support has been affected. That oh, yeah, that was a big one. Yep. by the spousal support payer. So that usually will result in a smaller spousal yeah. support award going to the support receiver. So this yeah. is great. Thank you. Is that was probably can fit in one more. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, I'll be 50 this year, um, and I have some good investments in a life insurance, whole life program, and also mutual funds um, and an, an emergency fund. But I also have two children that are. 10 and 13, so college is looming ahead. Um, but I want to take a one, one risk. <laughs> I want to do one risky investment. And someone came to me and uh, suggested I do an index fund, and then I got scared and backed out. What would you suggest would be something that I could really amp up my retirement potential with that's riskier? What's a good product? What did well, you like about the index, index fund? Index yeah. not risky. Yeah. It's not. It, it, well, this particular one was super aggressive. Oh. And then the market was well, really but, good. This was last year. But so. also if you have a balanced, you know, you might have some riskier, some, they should all offset each other in a general question. You should have a, a variety of different things in your portfolio to mitigate some of that risk. So if one stock falls, your whole portfolio isn't falling or your one fund falls. So that index fund could have been a mix with other funds in the portfolio. This, this is the way I think about market risk. If you're 50 now, the average woman's life expectancy is 86.5, OK? Mm -hmm. You are educated. You are better off. You're probably looking at 90 or 95. You have decades ahead mm -hmm. of you. So what goes on in the markets today? It's noise. Yeah, it doesn't shouldn't. matter. Yeah. What matters is what happens over time. And look back where we were 40 years ago. I mean, the market's just phew. So I would say if you're, if you're just getting your feet wet, uh, broad market, like to, uh, Vanguard's total stock market index fund. And you know, maybe if, you, if you're just starting, do 50%, 50%. So 50% stock market, 50% in bonds. That's, that's kind of a couch potato, really super easy way to start. But I think we're all really huge fans of index funds because they're super cheap. <coughs> and that's what makes the difference. You've got to yep. get into investing, and you've got to keep the cost down. So and I think that helps. All right. One more thing. You did say you have a whole life policy. I would just say whole life is the most expensive kind of insurance you can get. And one thing you could do is get a second opinion and see if you could replace that whole life policy with an indexed universal. Cash. Yeah. yeah, but you can look at that and, and roll it over instead into an indexed universal life policy, which would have some of the benefits of indexing. But there's going to be, be less tax. expensive. There could be a tax. Well, it depends <laughs> on how much cash it is. <laughs> really primarily oversold. So yeah. you'd be amazed how often, no matter how good you thought your advisor was, um, they may have oversold, and especially if I hear whole life and you're, and you're young and you have your act together, you could save so much money just by moving a whole life into a better design life insurance policy that could accumulate some cash value for college savings, have your long-term care built in. So that's one place I see, uh, you know, you could, and then there are other cool things like crowdfunding for commercial real estate ventures where you only need like $500 a month. That's a little risky, but also probably not too, too crazy. I'm a fan Fun. of real estate. Yeah. So, you know, there are lots of things you can do. I'd say just get some really good people on your team if you don't already. And if you do have good people, ask them the same yeah. question. Yes. So if you have other them. questions, our panelists will be here for a couple minutes. Mm -hmm. Just to re reiterate a couple points we heard today. Wherever you are, start now. Time is your friend. It's better than being a genius. Just get going and look for those core advisors. I love this team. They're terrific panelists. Have a hand for And you guys are here. So you're doing good Thank today you. already. Thank you. So now that you're inspired by this incredible panel of women, let's continue this feeling. Please visit our website at mptf.com. Follow us on all our social media feeds, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Or if you're so inclined, we'd be so grateful for your support.
You can text MPTF to 41444 to make a donation.